Vestis, and I'm looking for something. Actually, I'm looking for someone. Is that someone you? I want DAWA partners, and you can be my DAWA partner right now. It's real easy. Just go to DAWAPartners.com, sign up, and join me. There are three things that I would like for you to be able to do. Any one of them, or all of them. Beautiful. Number one, you will make dua. So you can be our Dawa partner, even if you don't go to the website, but I hope you do. Number two, share. Share this message and let other people know about becoming Dawa partners. And number three, help us financially. Donate on a monthly basis, even if it's small. Allah loves the thing that you do regularly. Even if it's small, more than the thing that you do that's really big, but you only do it once. Join me as a Dawa partner. Do it now. Click, 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 click. A way of life, a way of life, a way of life, a way of life. Islam is a way of life, a complete way. Coming to you almost live from our recently, uh, <laughs> yeah, recently remodeled uh, yeah, studios here in Southern California. <laughs> All right, uh, we are a little bit late tonight and a lot of confusion around here. But uh, the good news is that uh, Alhamdulillah, how do you like it? It looks pretty good to me. All right, so do we have Sister Kim with us tonight? Yes, we do. All right, Sister Kim. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Good to see you finally. Yeah. Well, I know you've been standing by, and uh, well, maybe you're sitting by anyway. How you like my new outfit here? Uh, pretty oh, sharp. It's really snazzy. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, so uh, well. Let's get started. We're going to do a full hour show, although we started on the half hour, so that uh, you'll get uh, you'll get your money's worth, even though you didn't have to pay for it. All right, how about that? Alhamdulillah. So, sister, we were talking about a very serious subject uh, yesterday, and uh, the idea of young people committing suicide and attempting to commit suicide, and I wanted to kind of rounded off today by going over some of the things that we can do, should do, and must not do, is kind of wind all of that up and then go on to our next program for this, uh, for this uh, special day. Uh, this Thursday is a very special day because, it must be special because of all this stuff that's happening. You, you get a lot of rewards if you're patient whenever things are going wrong. You know that. So this is Rewards Day. <laughs> of the love, of the love. Sister, kind of give us a recap of what we talked about yesterday. And while you're doing that, I'll, I'll work on setting up the presentation side of it, okay? Sure thing. Last year day, we were talking about um, the tragic incidence of suicide, especially amongst young people, yeah. and studies that had come out that showed that attempted suicides, um, especially between the ages of 12 and 17, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, especially between the ages of 12 and 17, have been skyrocketing since the pandemic. And um, I think it's important to say a few things. We didn't really talk about this last night, but what you should and what you should not say to somebody who's 
um, contemplating suicide. Yeah, you know um, what? I I really would like to start it with that. What should we not do? I, I had it reversed, but I was saying what we should do and what we should, should not do. But let's start with what we shouldn't do. What should you not say to somebody who is... I, I, I'm going to guess. Oh, it'll be all right. <laughs> that is one. Uh, one of the biggest ones, actually, is to say, I know where you're coming from, is one of the biggest ones, where you feel that you are telling this person that you can share their experience and the pain that they're feeling. But what it actually does is it puts down the amount of suffering that they're going through. And so it's very important not to say, oh, I hear you. I know where you're coming from. Oh, I've felt that way before and stuff like that. And to instead take the time to listen to them. What you should say instead of, you know, I know what you're going through is you should say, what are you going through? Let me listen and maybe I can help and get them to talk. The longer they're talking, the longer they are not taking their life. And so it's very important to keep the person engaged until you can help determine what is the best way to help this person. All right. Uh, well, uh, what are some of the things that uh, sister that you would recommend that we should say as opposed to what we don't say in other words the, oh it'll be okay do, don't do that uh, think about your kids or think about your parents or uh, all of those kinds of things I'm I'm sure I'm pretty sure I never had that happen to me but I'm pretty sure that they already contemplated all of that and uh, Otherwise, they wouldn't consider what they're doing. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, the, um, and just in case you weren't watching last night, I am speaking from personal experience. My husband committed suicide about six years ago. And so since then, I've been a big advocate of helping other people not do this. And so I've done a lot of study into it. The best thing that you can do for somebody that is contemplating suicide, like I said, is listen. You, we are, as humans, tempted to talk to the person and talk them out of it. But you can't do that until you know what their problem is. So ask them, what are they going through? And just to give a general example, say, uh, the person is having trouble finding a job and they feel worthless. Uh, ask them questions related to what they just said. You know, don't say, oh, everybody has trouble getting a job or the job market's really bad right now. Say, what have you tried? And work with them in trying to find a solution. Give them um, tools and resources that they can use to help get them out of their situation. Now, sometimes you also have to admit that there are just, there's nothing that you can do. You've tried everything. Um, you've talked to them and you just can't offer any help. And that's when you know it's time to turn it over to somebody else that can provide a resource for someone that's suicidal, such as calling the National Suicide Hotline. Um, uh, is there, is there uh, something like that, sister? Yes, there is. In just one moment, I'll have the phone number for you. All right. In the meantime, while she's doing that, I'd just like to touch on the fact that uh, there are a lot of people who have attempted suicide and that those numbers have increased as well. Now, in some cases, you might think, oh, well, there, there she goes again. She didn't commit suicide last time. She just called the, you know, somebody and started complaining, said, I'm going to take my life and blah, blah, blah. However, however, this could be a kind of a call for help. And maybe if you ignore them, they will succeed in what they're doing and... Uh, 
that's obviously what we don't want to happen. So uh, the sister is telling us that there is a phone number that can be called, and I think that we should uh, make a note of that. I'm going to write it down as well. Yes, the National Suicide Hotline, this is for the United States, okay. and it serves both English and Spanish, is 1-800-273-8255. All right. Okay. All right. I, I wanted to write that down. Now, we have on our phone number here, right in front of me, this 1-800-971-4383. That's to call in and talk with us about the program. So if you want to talk about that, but if you really feel that uh, you know somebody that needs to call this number, this the suicide number, that, that suicide hotline, that is 1-800-273-8255. Five. And it wouldn't hurt if you wrote that down and just kept it somewhere. Who knows? You might encounter somebody or you might even have something yourself sometime you'd really like to talk about and not put it all you're talking about on the air. Like when you call in on our show, you can talk about it, but you'll be talking to millions of people when you do. All right. So 1-800-971-4383 is the number you can call right now and talk about our topic or any topic you would like to talk about, all right? So if you make a note of our number, as, as we go along, most of the time it'll be up, except when I'm showing you some of the images. So I, we opted to take that off, of, take our number off when we're showing the images because it... Uh, doesn't really help promote what we're trying to do. All right, so uh, attempted suicides. Sister, what else you got for us on that? The other thing that people should be aware of is that if they were to call their local hospital, their local hospital can recommend a place so the person that is suicidal can go to for at least 24 hours where they are in a safe environment. Sometimes it'll be the hospital itself. Sometimes it'll be a crisis center. Um, but their hospital will be able to recommend someplace safe for them to go to so that they don't harm themselves. Um, to the best of my knowledge, this is not the same thing as committing a person to a hospital where somebody is taken against their own will and forcibly hospitalized for mental health reasons. Um, when you go to the hospital because you're having suicidal thoughts, um, all they're doing is providing a safe place to make sure that you're watched over. We have a phone call. We have a phone call. It's exciting. Oh, all right, let's, uh, let's take we this phone, phone call, call right now. We, we do have somebody on the phone here, and let's see what we can do. Salam alaikum. Alaikum assalam. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Is this Habib? Yes, this is Habib. In Canada, uh, people can contact mental health for... Uh, in regards to people having problems with, uh, you know, suicide thoughts and this type of thing. Uh, I, I know myself from experience because I, I tried uh, several times in the past. Uh, even in my family, there's different ones that, uh, as a matter of fact, my uncle on my father's side committed suicide by driving his car off the wharf. So uh, I, I know that this is a, a really difficult for a lot of people. The other thing that you should never say to somebody that's thinking about committing suicide in, in telling you this, you never tell them that they're being selfish by doing this. 
because you're you're the only thing you're doing is laying a guilt trip on them that they don't need and sometimes just listening to them and allowing them to talk with you and you know having a cup of coffee with this person and allowing them to share and sometimes you need to vent and get what's uh, what's troubling them and a lot of times by them being able to speak to somebody this is also helpful and and like sister kim says you know to to point them in the right direction help them with what you know something they never thought of about getting a job or you know some of the struggles that they're going through helping them you know to find new tools to be able to do this all right that that's some very good tips there let me ask you this question if you don't mind have you ever had a experience with dealing with someone who has the, these inclinations? Well, there, like I said, there's myself, and I also had friends that had these thoughts as well. Well, what I've heard from some of the scholars of Islam is that whenever you hear voices in your something in your head is talking to you saying this to kill yourself or kill this other person or do some real uh, horrendous deed they say that this is actually an influence from the devil from the shaitan uh, have you ever heard about something like this yes but there's also when you're looking at medical doctors do you have a different approach to this as well in, in regards to mental illness? So you got both sides that are saying things. And in a lot of cases, you know, when you're looking at a mental issue, sometimes it is a, a spiritual in, influence that it could be a gin. And there are times that because of the chemical makeup of your brain, that you're, it's actually yourself that's causing this. All right. Um, I was just curious about that, if, if uh, you'd heard about something like that. Also, uh, I would like to establish, in my mind at least, that the person has these thoughts that that is not something that they have all the time is it just like it just comes all at once or is that something that uh, it lingers on and they suppress it or i don't know can you tell us about that well when i had it and i was hearing voices there there was two voices both of them were negative, but one was supposedly God, the other one was supposedly the devil. And when you have these voices, it's a constant thing. And uh, for me, I felt that I had to be moving around a lot to, to try to stop these voices. And eventually, I ended up going to the psychiatric hospital in Campbellton and spending time there. But it was still years later before these voices actually stopped. Uh, so, I see what you... I, 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 I think a lot that these voices stopped. I, for, for anybody that goes through this, nobody understands the the amount of mental anguish that this person's under mm. until you live through it yourself you you don't know may i ask a a question yes please go ahead sister assalamu alaikum habib this is kim assalamu alaikum kim um, I was just curious. I have uh, psychological issues, and I am on antipsychosis medication. 
and I was wondering if you found that medication helped you or were you able to get past this without medication? For a period of time, I was on medication. Then I, uh, this was 2000. I started seeing a homeopathic doctor and he helped uh, me get off of all these medications that I was on because if you would have seen me then, I was more like a walking zombie. Like I would not smile, there was no, like you would see me, but there wouldn't be me, if you know what I mean. Yes, I do know what you mean. Being on those medications, the ones that I'm on, are very altering to the mind and there are a lot of side effects and it takes away a lot of your personality. Yeah, it does, it does. Uh, the thing is, if, you know, if you can find medications that can help that are have less of the side effects that these do, then you're better off. But it's it's the question of finding somebody that can treat you and give you what you need, either homeopathically or otherwise. But it, it, it's one of those things that it's quite difficult. And for me, uh, like now, the only medication that I take it has nothing to do with that at all. It's like blood pressure and cholesterol. So really, I'm not on any medication. I know my uh, triggers, and one of the places I know that I can't live is actually my home city. I, I can't live in Cam Campbellton because the last time I was there, I, I was starting to hear voices again, and I knew at that point I had to go back to Moncton. So that's what I ended up doing just to prevent a relapse. Yeah, I um, gained a lot of peace of mind by moving out of my hometown as well, um, where um, my husband committed suicide and I had a lot of bad memories and I moved to Arizona and I've been able to cut down on my medication significantly, but I have not been able to go off them yet. Well, I think it's a good well, idea. The... Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just saying, I think it's a good idea if a person can uh, get help to take the help immediately and, uh, you know, go to the doctors or go to the counselors and get any any medication that will help you out initially. But then uh, after, you know, the initial thing, and then I would, I would think that it would be a wise idea if you can move to another place like Sister did so that you can reduce that medication because eventually the medication is really not going to, it's going to be another added problem. And, and, you know, it may be not as big as the other problems, but the, these medications are, <laughs> they, they don't really help, they just hinder the problem for a period of time, but uh, nothing. Well, that all depends. Um, there are really two classes of people that would have a suicidal ideation. And they are people who have thoughts of suicide due to their environment. And there are people who have thoughts of suicide due to mental illness. And mental illness does not always go away. And it's not something that you can treat just by talking about it. And so those people might be on medications for the rest of their lives. I've talked to several doctors about whether or not I was ever going to get better. 
and they said, chances are not. You are probably going to be on these medications for the rest of your life. And I keep looking for alternatives and I have not found one yet. So, um, you know, I think it's a little bit, it, it would be um, too optimistic to say that people should be able to go off their medications after a little while because that puts the thought in people's heads, especially those that are on medications that are working, you know, they say, oh, I don't need them anymore. And then they go off their meds and they have withdrawals and they have a return back to the chemical imbalances that had been affecting them. And uh, they're in a worse position than they were in before. So, you know, my advice is never go off your medications without a doctor's orders. Um, because you can be putting yourself in a really bad situation if you do. I've done it. I don't recommend it. Oh, I, I see. I see what you're getting at. This is uh, this is something really that uh, for me, I I cannot put myself in somebody else's place like that. I can't imagine this kind of thing. However, I get, I know about being depressed to a, ex, to a certain extent anyway, but. I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not the best person for you to get sympathy from because I really don't know how to put myself in the other person's uh, position like that. And in some cases, like for instance, if uh, I worked in the prison system, all right, and I came up a, a, with a lot of ideas, but when I would try to talk to the inmates there, they would tell me, you just don't understand. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I don't. I've never, I've never been in their position. And so I have to listen to them tell me what it's like. And um, I'm a good listener, but I, I don't know that I can come up with anything that's real positive or not. Yeah, that is the hard part for people that have never experienced this before. You know, that's something that you can always do is get them in touch with someone who has experienced it before. You know, I know that um, for me talking to people, you know, because I, back when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, I had thoughts of suicide. And um, what helped me was talking to other people who had, had thoughts of suicide. Um, you know, because, you know, they do understand, you know, the amount of pain that it takes to get you to that point and how difficult it is to live day by day. Like you asked earlier, is a thoughts of suicide something that comes all in a wave and then it goes away? Or is it something that you have to deal with on a daily basis? You have to deal with it on a daily basis. This is something that can go on for years. And, um, you know, surviving one day at a time takes all of a person's effort. And the side effects of suicidal thoughts is something else that other people don't understand. They don't understand why the person that's suicidal will sleep for 20 hours a day. They don't understand why the person that's suicidal will lock themselves in a room and not want to talk to anybody. And sometimes it takes somebody who's been there to know the right questions to ask of a person um, to help them get out of that vicious cycle in their head that says that they have to kill themselves. Yeah. I I think that uh, our, our topic was even uh, more specific than just a general thing too because when we are talking about the the youth, I want to put an image up here. It's, this is talking about teen depression is linked to social media screen time, but video games are okay. Now, why, 
why would a video game be all right, but at the same time, social media screen time is uh, bad, sister? Oh, I can answer that one very easily. I am a huge gamer. Um, I play video games for several hours a day, and I also spend a lot of time on Facebook as part of doing this show where I'm researching news and keeping up on what's going on and um, staying in touch with friends and family and things. And I look at plenty of pictures of cats. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but um, on social media, there is a very negative vibe to it. Um, people tend to go to social media not to post about the good things going on in their lives, but about the bad things that are going on in their lives. It's very, you know, for every good thing that you read, you read four bad things. And the news does not tend to be very positive. It tends to focus on the negative. And so it is a great tool for making people feeling bad. Whereas a video game is an escape. It is a chance to get out of your own mind and into another story. And in the case of a lot of games these days, it's a chance to interact with others, whether you're talking to them on a headset while you're playing a game, or if you're using an in-game chat feature. Um, and so video games can be very, very helpful for the person who is having negative thoughts um, by giving them something else to focus on. And the great thing about it is that um, the reward, not spiritual reward, but the mental reward um, for playing these games keeps you coming back every day. And if that's all it takes is for someone to say, you know, well, I have to go back into whatever game it is tomorrow because I told so-and-so I'd meet them. You know, having a, um, a positive place where you can interact and burn off some steam and um, chat with others in a positive environment can be a huge thing to people that ha um, have mental illness. All right, uh, sister. I would. I, you you seem to be the our local expert on this subject right now. <laughs> what uh, you mentioned a couple of things, and also uh, Habib mentioned something. What else should we not do with somebody that's uh, showing these signs? Uh, well, first of all, wait a minute. What are some of the signs that I could look at and know that? You mentioned somebody who d doesn't want to talk, somebody who wants to go in their room and just lock the door, and uh, but some other signs that would be a, a lot more clear. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Um, some very common signs of people that have depression in general, you know, um, not just suicidal thoughts, but just depression in general or mental illness is either sleeping abnormal amounts, you know, 14 to 20 hours a day, um, constantly tired or constantly hyperactive. If you see somebody that can't sleep at all, you know, that's a sign of anxiety. Another sign is that somebody does not take care of themselves hygienically. If you notice that somebody has stopped taking showers, has stopped brushing their teeth, um, that shows that they don't care about themselves anymore. For some people, some people are just messy. But if there is a change in how they keep their house, if you have somebody that normally was very, very clean, and all of the sudden their house becomes a pile of dirty dishes and um, a pile of um, dirty clothes, and stuff like that, that means that they're no longer as involved in their day-to-day -day upkeep. And so those are just a few of the signs that you can watch for, for people that, um, you know, they might not be suicidal yet, but they are definitely having some mental health issues that should be discussed. All right. 
Habib, if you got anything else for us? Uh, uh, I think we lost Habib. Well, I mean. Oh, there he is. No, 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 you haven't lost it. Uh, one, one of the things that I was thinking about, and this is only because I was in a homeless shelter, and uh, the person that was sleeping in the bunk above me, he would talk to himself, and I noticed this. And uh, I pointed out to him, and I said, it's hard to keep these voices quiet in your head. And all of a sudden, he gets really quiet, and he goes, yeah, it is. So there's times that you can pick up on things from other people that if you are more tuned to other people and other people's feelings, that can be helpful. Okay, uh, we've got to take a break right now. Guys, I really appreciate what you're doing here and helping me and our viewers to understand a lot more about this subject. So when we come back, I want to go, really go back to the teenage thing and uh, wrap this up. Uh, so anyway, everybody stay tuned. Stay guided with Guide Us TV. We'll be right back right after this short little break. Guide Us TV, watched by many, loved by all, new Muslims, young Muslims, born Muslims, non-Muslims, all enjoy it. Guide Us TV, never ads, always free. Let's keep it free, no ads. Support and share, and get guided with Guide Us TV. All right, everybody, thank you so much for staying tuned on Let's Talk About It. We're with uh, Brother Yusuf Estes, Sheikh Yusuf Estes, I should say. Brother Habib is on the phone, and we have been talking about suicide and mental illness. And if you have missed any of this, this is one show that I would really recommend to watch for it on YouTube, to watch for it on social media, and go back and listen to that last half hour that... Um, we've been going over we've talked about ways to uh figure out if somebody is depressed what to say to people that are uh contemplating suicide what not to say um the value and the dangers of social media when it comes to suicidal thoughts and so this is a show that you don't want to miss any of go back when we're done broadcasting and we post the show um, to social media and YouTube um, and listen to the whole thing from the beginning and be sure to share it because this is one of those shows that might save somebody's life and I'm not exaggerating about that. Um, so uh, on your social media, share it, share it with your friends, share it with your family um, and make sure that the word gets out that people that are having suicidal thoughts or mental illness, there is help available. And we're going to be talking about that, especially when it comes to teenagers now. And um, Sheikh Yusuf Estes has been doing some uh, research into this and came up with some alarming numbers for well, teenagers who were thinking about suicide. I did do a little bit of, about that, but I, what I really was focusing on was the statistical side of it, rather than dealing with the subject about suicide. I wanted to know, was there an increase of this, uh, people taking their own lives, based on this uh, pandemic and the influence it would have? Turns out, yeah, that's a real big thing, but it's not the number one killer of uh, people, even though that it's been promoted. It's in third place now, but still the number one thing is something to do with your heart. Anything related to your heart, uh, take you right out right away. So, but suicide becoming up in this third place, and attempts of suicide are exponential. These uh, these numbers have gone way off the charts because there are more and more young people that are trying to commit suicide. And it, and the report was talking about one of the main things that. I, I was not a normal kid, all right? I know that. I know I wasn't normal because from the very first day, I didn't want to go to school until the last day in high school when I walked out the door, I said, good, I've been released from prison. 
you know that's that was my attitude so i'm not the not the person to go for what is normal but and along the way i was happy anytime we had a day off i was happy anytime we had a, a three-day weekend or we had a vacation and i looked forward to june the second because that was usually a, a day that we would start our summer vacation and i dreaded going back to school and i found from my children and from my grandchildren that they like to go to school they like their friends they have and i and i didn't make any friends at school almost almost never because i just wanted to have my own friends at home and the people that i know and these people at the school are like enemies <laughs> so yeah and uh, we all have the problem of these bullies attacking us and so on i felt like everybody was against me there and so it, for me the best way was just stay away from it anything that i don't like i just stay away from if, if people are drinking alcohol and chasing around and doing stupid things in my book that's stupid so i would just stay away from them if people are smoking i want to stay away from them so i i thought that was normal and then i come to find out that uh, watching my grandchildren watching my children i found out i'm not a normal person or oh, quote i'm putting that in air quotes <laughs> i'm not a normal person whatever what is normal though and uh i don't want to be i don't want to be like this and dependent on on alcohol or dependent on cigarettes or depending on uh social media or anything else i i, I don't want that i want my relationship to be with the creator and i've been searching for that all my life and when i came to islam it was like okay problem solved i don't care about anything anymore i'm good to go because i know that i have a creator he put me here for a purpose i just want to know make sure what i'm doing is fulfilling my purpose i'm good to go so in that way i am not a normal person because most people don't know that is that right sister yeah, and that actually raises a really good question. Children that are raised in a spiritual household that get to the point where they might be contemplating suicide or might have a mental illness will invariably raise the question, how can a loving God allow this to happen to me? And perhaps you could shed some light on that. Well, yeah, when it comes to the kiddos, and then one of them is just kind of left out of the whole thing and that that's an image that i just saw on here and i, I think that that that's kind of the image that i didn't i never felt because sometimes people would say well you don't like the kids maybe you're going and i'm like no hey it's not about not liking them i just don't like the situation i don't like the situation and i'll stay away from it that yeah. so whenever you look at these statistics and you realize that there are a huge number of young people today that are really lost out there and whenever you come up with a question like that i can understand maybe better what they're going through because if they're asking the question how can god do this that I think they have missed out on the whole point anyway. We're never going to be here forever. That's that is on purpose the way I said that. We're never going to be here forever. Meaning that you for sure you came into the world and sure you're going to go out of it. So what is your purpose while you're here? If you have a creator, he has a purpose for whatever he's doing. Try to find out what his purpose is. And that's exactly what my friend told me to do one time. And I did it, man, problem solved. Just like that. Because the idea was not a very complicated one at all. It was a very simple, very simple method. Just talk to the one that created you. Because if there is a creator, 
and you really want to have a communication with him, then it's really up to him to provide that communication system. Otherwise, hey, I didn't create God. I didn't create the universe. So I'm dependent on him to come up with something that we can communicate back and forth. Now, maybe I've been missing the point along the way. Maybe I've been, uh, you know, looking in the wrong places, but let me try that. And that's exactly what I did. Then my friend told me, this is not about you and me. Oh, okay. It's not about you and your wife. So, all right. Not about you and your father. This whole thing is not about you and anybody else on the planet. This is about you and him. Go talk to him. And he walked off and left me standing there. And I was like, huh? Wait a minute. But I took his advice. But I saw the Muslims pray. And they put their head on the ground. And I said, let me humble myself in front of my creator. If there is a creator. I'll humble myself and put my head on the ground like these Muslims do. I didn't. I forgot, you know, that's in the Bible as well, that they fell up on their faces. <laughs> but anyway, I put my head down, and I was trying to think of something to say, and it just came in my mind. God, if you're there, guide me. And everything clicked right then. It all clicked. For me, it clicked right away. Because I realized that the problem is not outside. The problem is inside. Until the person can identify that they themselves need God. They need to have a relationship with God. They really need to have the power of God reinforcing what they're going through and once they have that and that's when I raised my head up off the ground and I thought about it I said it's really not about the outside world I don't need to be looking for rainbows and flashlights going on all of that no all I need is to look at myself inside and realize that I need to change me not change the outside world, but change myself. And I've been working on that for the last 30 years and two weeks. 30 years and two weeks. Yeah. And it's great. I'm doing. So, but uh, enough about all of me. And, and I really want to get back to the, the children, the, the young people, because uh, I, I really have no idea of the teenagers, especially, I, I was so happy when I was a teenager, but I find that these teenagers are the, the group that's growing the fastest in attempted suicides. Over a 50% increase over what it was in uh, 2019 of these children trying to commit suicide. And that was as of February of this year, and it's increasing more, but we don't know the numbers. So this is this is something to think about. What is going on in their heads? What's going on in their minds? What's going on in their lives that's causing this? And I used to it's think... Not that hard. I'm sorry. It's not that hard when you look at the situation that teenagers are living in these days, um, especially with the pandemic when they were home with their parents. Um, the number of lower class people is higher than at any point, save the depression. And when teenagers are home with their parents and they're seeing the trouble that they're having paying rent, they're seeing the trouble that they're having in their day to day lives. They're seeing the drudgery of work every day. Uh, I'll give you an example. This is a friend of mine um, who recently turned 21 and has been suffering from suicidal thoughts for many years. And he said back many years ago to me, 
everything would be better if I had my own house and a good paying job where I could have my pets. And now he's 21. He's got a house that he bought with a friend of his. It's out in the country. He can do whatever he wants. He has a good paying job. He has all his pets and he's just as suicidal as before. Because he's realizing that there is not a lot that life itself offers outside of work, come home, relax a little bit, go to bed, and get up and do it all again the next day. And that there's no purpose to life in his point of view. And a lot of teenagers are seeing life this way right now. There's no purpose to it other than get up, go to school, come home, maybe have a couple hours to yourself, go to bed, do it all over again. And then it just turns into work once you're out of school. And so they don't see a point in extending their lives anymore. And so what would you say to somebody who just no longer sees the point in it all? I don't know. Maybe that you could give us the a, a good answer to that question. I know you posed the question, but maybe you have an answer. What would what would you say to somebody like that? Well, the thing that I would say to somebody like that is that, like I told my friend who wanted the house and wanted the good paying job, you know, there's a lot more to life than that. And what you have to find is your joy in life you know it might be a hobby for some people it might be travel for some people and travel does not have to be to timbuktu travel can just be to the other side of the city and visiting a museum um it might be uh joining a group of like-minded people over something that you all enjoy or it might be joining a group of people who feel exactly the same way that you do that need support. You might find that in your moment of darkness, you are the greatest support that somebody could ever have. And so don't focus on the day-to-day -day plotting that you do through life. Focus on what you can do to make the rest of your life more bearable and make it a positive affirmation that you give to yourself every day that you are going to do something today that is going to make you happy and if it doesn't make you happy keep trying keep trying new things have new experiences meet new people and don't give up i like that don't give up i think that a person who gives up, uh, they have found the only way that they could really lose in this life. The biggest loser is always the one who gives up. Because even if you come in last, you finish the race. But if you give up, you got nothing. Nothing at all. I, I, I really appreciate that. Give us some more information about this, uh, if you don't mind. Sister, this is really good. Well, sure. I mean, please keep in mind that at the time I was not a Muslim, so I did not have the Quran to fall back on or anything like that. I had to find my happiness in um, the other things in life. We didn't even really have a, a good connection to the Internet at the time. This was the day of dial-up where your parents told you you could be online for half an hour. And so I found a lot of escape in books and um, became a voracious reader. I also spent a lot of time in the woods. I would walk through the woods and felt a lot of peace and connection to um, the area around me. And um, while I was out in the woods, I learned survival skills. You know, I learned how to build a fire without matches. I knew I learned how to build a shelter, an actual house 
on my own and I built a house out in the middle of the woods that I could go to whenever I wanted to get away from it all. And um, I was a very introspective person and um, did not have a lot of friends either. And my mother could not understand how I could go out in the woods for hours and just walk. And she was convinced I was doing drugs out there. Of course, I never came home soon. So she didn't really have a lot of argument for that. But um, yeah, I found peace in, um, like I said, in books and walking away from the um, pressures of human life and um, spending time by myself and um, with the animals and things like that. That was my big release. Oh, mashallah. So what kind of animals did you... Uh, uh, well, you said reading books and animals, and I found a picture right here. There you go. And uh, I know it'll take time for you to show up on your screen because there, there is a 30-second delay. But uh, when you get a chance and uh, you can take a look at the... This is uh, the animals reading the books. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Little Jack Russell Terrier puppies. Oh, that's called Jack Russell? I didn't know that. Yeah, those are Jack Russells. Oh, okay. Well, you know more about dogs than I do. But uh, <laughs> I know hunting dogs. Uh, yeah, I, the books that I read tended to be fantasy. Lots of books with dragons and aliens and um, wizards and all that sort of thing. You know, anything that would take me away even to this day like if i'm watching a movie if it doesn't have a superhero a dragon or an alien spaceship in it i won't watch it mashallah well uh, let me ask you uh, i think we still have habib habib you still with us yes there, there is one thing i wanted to point out this is goes back a couple of years on talking to one of my friend's sons and uh, in our conversation, he's telling me that his father doesn't even pay attention to him. And he proved it to me because his father was sitting right in front of us. He said something to him and he said to me, it's like, I don't exist. It's like my father doesn't listen to me. My father doesn't recognize me. And, and this is a, 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 a Muslim, but this is when, because he has so many kids, that this becomes a problem that they don't listen to their children. And for some reason, I, 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 this escapes me. How can it be that a, a father can be right there in front of the child and not pay attention? I, I don't know about that. That's, uh, yeah. I, I've seen it happen. That's the funny thing. Uh, here, here's something that, uh, uh, we got to wrap it up, but I'm going to show you a, a great picture here. A little boy spoon feeding his dad. There you go. That's what Islam is about. Uh, dads are telling stories to the kids and moms are helping out the little girls and helping them in the kitchen, learning things. And uh, I think this uh, this sums up, you got, a picture's worth a thousand words. So share this, guys, share this. And we've got to wrap it up. So everybody stay tuned and stay guided with... Guide Us TV. Guide Us TV. Ah. Yusuf asked this, and I'm looking for something. Actually, I'm looking for someone. Is that someone you? I want Dawa partners, and you can be my Dawa partner right now. It's real easy. Just go to DawaPartners.com, sign up, and join me. There are three things that I would like for you to be able to do. Any one of them, or all of them. Beautiful. Number one, you will make Dua. So you can be our Dawa partner, even if you don't go to the website, but I hope you do. Number two, 
share. Share this message and let other people know about becoming Dawa Partners. And number three, help us financially. Donate on a monthly basis, even if it's small. Allah loves the thing that you do regularly. Even if it's small, more than the thing that you do that's really big, but you only do it once. Join me as a Dawa Partner. Do it now. Click, 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 click. Ooh.